Well, when I was a boy, I grew up in the Bay Area, and I uh, was fascinated by a house that had been built without a blueprint. Some of you may know this house is called the Winchester Mystery House. Have you, ever, have you ever been there? The Winchester Mystery House was built by Sarah Winchester, who is the wife and heiress of the man who invented the Winchester rifle. And around the time of the Civil War, the Winchester rifle had killed so many people, she felt she was haunted by the spirits of those who were deceased. She went to see a medium in Boston, and the medium told her that the way to ward off these spirits was construction, to be building, to build your, a house and to build it continuously. So from 1884 to, to, to 1922, uh, she was building this house just constantly. And if you visit it today, it's, a, it's weird. It's a little bit sp spooky, but um, it, it, it has stairways that go nowhere, uh, right into a ceiling. There are these weaving halls that kind of lead you to nowhere. And then there are doors that you can open, just a wall on the other side of the door, or some places just nothing and a 40-foot drop if you were to walk through that door. Thinking about this, I think, you know, my life is not that different from that. It kind of feel, feels familiar to me as I look back on the past, you know, I'm 54 years old, and I think, you know, there's that kind of construction in my life, too. There are these uh, stairways that go nowhere. There are hallways that seem to wind meaninglessly all over the place. There are doors that opened into walls or uh, deep falls. And I ask myself, do I have a blueprint for my life? I mean, if you wouldn't if you wouldn't build a house without a blueprint, blueprint, why would I build a life without a blueprint? Particularly in a season of growth or dynamic change, like we're facing today in our city, uh, in our wider culture, and even in our church. So we've been learning from Jeremiah, who is called to be a builder. And I'd like to suggest today that Jeremiah believed in the blueprint believe that there was a blueprint for his life and for the people he was building. Uh, remember, Jeremiah was called around the age of a college freshman. And uh, we read the story in chapter 1. In verse 5, uh, God says to him, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. In other words, there was a blueprint there. And likewise, in chapter 24, verse 6, the Lord says through Jeremiah about building a people, he says, I have set my eyes on this people for good. I will bring you back to this land, meaning after an exile, and I will build you up. There's a blueprint. God has a plan. He has a blueprint for life. The question this morning I'd like to interact with you over is, how, how do we discover it? How do we know what it is? There are just so many possibilities and forks in the road. We're going to turn to Jeremiah 28. Uh, this point in Israel's history is a period of dynamic change, not unlike what we're facing in Seattle. And in the context of that turmoil, there are two prophets. This is kind of fun because they go head to head. They clash. These two prophets, uh, they clash over the blueprint. The year is 593 B.C. I'm going to give you a little history today, so bear with me. It would be about 16 years after the temple sermon was preached that we talked about last week. And just four years prior to 593, what had happened was the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had swept through, raided the temple, stolen the gold, taken 10,000 people from Jerusalem back up to Babylon in captivity, and the exile had begun with this. Okay, so I say we have this contest. Here's the scene. It's the temple. It's what's left of the temple. That's where these two prophets show up. The question they're fighting over is how long will the exile last? And the players are a prophet named Hananiah, who says six years will be short, short exile. And our own Jeremiah, who says it'll be 70 years long exile. The problem is that they both say, thus says the Lord. Okay, you see the issue for, for an ordinary person like me and you. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's look at this in Jeremiah 28. Pull out the Bible that you brought or that's in the rack in front of you there, the black book, and turn to page 638, Jeremiah 28, and it's long. So let me just read it myself, but when we read it uh, afterwards, I'll say this is the word of the Lord so that if you believe it, you could say thanks be to God. 
Listen carefully, you're, reading, you're hearing God's holy word. Uh, in that same year, at the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. That's Hananiah. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. <laughs> May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Uh, but listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times, they prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. And then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord. This is how I will break the yoke of the king of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon from the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go tell Hananiah, thus says the Lord. You have broken wooden bars, only to forge iron bars in place of them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put an iron yoke on the neck of all these nations so that they may serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. They shall indeed serve him. I've even given him the wild animals. And the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm going to send you off the face of the earth. Within this year you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. This is the word of the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what we just heard never will. So can you put yourself in the shoes of somebody standing in the temple going, wait, 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 who do I, you know, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, and they don't agree with each other. And we find out that Hananiah is the one who's not telling the truth, but I have to say I'm fairly sympathetic to Hananiah. I don't know that he doesn't know that his word doesn't come from the Lord. It's, it would be so easy to think that it does, right? And he's got good news. By the way, you know, we live in a day in which fake news has become a really popular phrase. We talk about fake news all the time. And our question is not just how do we find true news, but how do we find good news, right? And here's the observation I'd like to make. I'd like to start with this, and that is that good news doesn't always seem like good news. That's really important. Because what Hananiah said to everybody seemed like good news. If you're sitting there and you're going, who do I wanna, who do I wanna believe here? The guy that says, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. You don't have to change anything. Sit tight. Two years, this whole thing will be over. Just keep your head down. That's Hananiah's message. Or Jeremiah says, you gotta change your life. <laughs> you gotta repent. You gotta turn around. You, you, you gotta get it together. Uh, turn back to God because this thing's gonna otherwise be 70 years and it's gonna be devastating. I, I, I kind of like Hananiah better, right? I kind of like, that sounds like good news to me. He's much more hopeful. Like, I think probably he's the one that God is speaking to. And I think they were all inclined to believe that. Even Jeremiah says, amen. Well, I wish that that were true. He's kind of tongue in cheek there. Problem is, he's wrong. Uh, for 30 years, Jeremiah has been telling Jerusalem that unless they turn back to God, there would be a 70 year Exile, saying would not be quick. And that's actually what will happen. So, so, so good news doesn't always seem good. And there's a difference between the truth and what we think the truth ought to be or what we want the truth to ought to be. 
hang, hang with me for a second. Somebody presents you with a truth claim. This is human nature. What we tend to do is we tend to, well, we, we question it, and we should question it. But the way that we question it is by seeing whether it fits into the beliefs we already hold to be true. And if it fits in, then we're inclined to accept it. If it doesn't fit in, then we tend to reject it. We have to be very, very careful about that. I mean, just an example. I tell you I can bench press my weight, right? Or that's a claim. And I don't really know that I can bench press my weight. It's been a long time since I've done that. So um, I'm just claiming that. Well, I don't know. You say, I don't know, George, it doesn't look like he weighs that much. So may I, maybe I believe that. And you say, well, you know, I've watched the Olympics and I see these guys bench press much more than what George weighs. It looks super easy. So, and I have lots of friends that bench press their weight. So you'd be inclined to believe that. You kind of fit that claim into things that you already believe. And you go, yeah, that kind of makes sense given what I already think about the world. The problem, though, is that if that's the only way that we evaluate truth claims, we will only be able to confirm what we already believe, that our current belief system, the structure of our current beliefs, actually becomes impervious to change or anything that would really be new. So that we're always constantly confirming our own biases, uh, we're only uh, uh, re and reinforcing our own prejudices. We're only looking for justification for the lifestyle that we're already committed uh, to living or we're trying to fit in a claim with the zeitgeist of the culture of the spirit of the age. This is very interesting. I saw the Seattle Times, I think it was just last week, wrote, even in educated Seattle, a zeitgeist is not the same thing as truth. I'm just saying, it's like, yeah, we got really smart people in Seattle, but just because all the smart people in Seattle say X, it doesn't mean X is actually true. And this is what's happening in Jerusalem right now. Everybody believes and wants to believe that this thing with Babylon is just a passing phase and that the greatness of our history and that the greatness of our temple will be enough to weather this dynamic season of change. Just keep your head down. Don't change a thing. And Jeremiah goes, I wish that were true. See, there's a whole lot in our culture today that says, thus saith the Lord. And we ought to be careful if we only listen to what we already agree with. If you find that your God, small case G, always agrees with you, it might just be that you're worshiping an idealized version of yourself. How do you like the sermon so far? Oh my gosh. I can't believe I survived the 8.30 service. Didn't go well for Jeremiah, by the way, either. Here's the point. Life isn't just a construction project. It's also a renovation project. So you and I have built some stuff in our lives that needs to come unbuilt if we're really gonna get what God wants for us. The problem with the Winchester History Mystery House in part is just that they just keep adding stuff on. They ask, okay, what's already here? And they keep, instead of having a design, tearing things down and rebuilding things, it's always just building, it gets weirder and weirder and weirder. And honestly, our lives are sometimes that way. I like the way Leslie Newbegins, very astute interpreter of culture, writes, the, the problem of making sense of the gospel is, is that it calls for a change of mind. To believe that the crucified Jesus rose from the dead, left an empty tomb, and regrouped his scattered disciples for their world mission can only be the result of a very radical change of mind, indeed. The simple truth is that the resurrection cannot be accommodated in any way of understanding the world except one of which it is a starting point. I love that. It's like you cannot fit the resurrection in, into the belief system you already have. If you're going to believe in the resurrection, that has to be the starting point for all your other beliefs. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Everything you thought you knew needs to die. And you need to let me teach you everything new. Now, uh, the biblical word for this is repentance. The, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament means literally to turn, to turn back, to find a new starting point. The Greek word in the New Testament means to change your mind. It really means a, to engage a new, whole new way of thinking. That's repentance. And, and this is what Jeremiah is calling Israel to, Judah to. And he, by the way, he's modeling this. I think this is really interesting. 
here's a prophet who says, thus saith the Lord. And Jeremiah doesn't really know, hand and I, one way or the other. And, and he's kind of, he says, well, you know, amen. He says, I, I wish that were true. But he knows it's not really because of what the Lord has already said to him. And uh, he's going to resist believing what he wants to believe. He's going to resist believing what the culture believes just because he wants it or the culture believes it. He warns them. Verse 8, if you see in verse 8, he says, you know, we have a history here, and the people who came and really did speak for the Lord tended to have really hard things to say to us. You know, they were talking about crisis. So let's just be aware of that. Let me digress for a second, uh, and, and, and long enough to commend your elders here at UPC. I'm really proud of them, because what they're doing right now is very much like what we see in Jeremiah. They're remembering their past and the pattern of what God has done here at UPC. They're listening to God, and they are embracing change. I don't know if you've noticed that a lot of these beautiful large churches on 15th Avenue are largely empty on a Sunday morning. Their congregations have dwindled, and one by one, the buildings are being sold. Well, your elders have noticed. They're paying attention to what God is calling us to. Last year, uh, they read a book by Todd Bolsinger called Canoeing the Mountains. In that, Todd Bolsinger tells a story of sitting at a bar with a pastor who was near retirement. The pastor's looking into his drink despondently, and he says, you know, when I began my ministry in a church in Alabama, I never worried about church growth or worship attendance or evangelism. Back then, if a man didn't come to church on Sunday, his boss asked him about it at work on Monday. You know this. We don't live in that world anymore. We haven't lived in that world a long time in Seattle, right? And to quote Billy Bean in Moneyball, it's adapt or die. Bolsinger uses the model of um, Lewis and Clark and their expeditions, a model for adaptive change in the church today. And you know the story of Lewis and Clark. They were looking for a a waterway passage across the continent. And when they got to the Rocky Mountains, everything they thought they knew had to change. A canoeing trip became a, became a mountain expedition or they would not go any further. Likewise, the church today needs to adapt and to change, to reclaim its history in a new season of ministry. The ecology around us is dramatically shifting. According to one analysis uh, published recently by the Pine Tops Foundation, if the, if the church does not adapt, over the next three decades, we will lose over one million American youth per year for 30 years. That's 35 million youth by the year 2050 who, are, who, who, are, who once said they were Christians who are now living outside of the faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, they call this report, by the way, The Great Opportunity, and I'm asking that we'll, I'll put it on our Facebook page, because the demographic trends are also very favorable for churches that can adapt to this new environment. They say the next 30 years represents the largest missions opportunity in the history of America. If we do a few basic things, we can reach more people for Christ in the next 30 years than the Great Awakening. This is an opportunity. And, and this is the opportunity for which our elders are positioning UPC, and I'm so excited about that. I want to be a part of that. This is a great day for us. Now, uh, we don't have a blueprint yet for that, but we have a fresh vision, and it's a vision that will take us back to a fresh starting point in the good news of Jesus Christ and send us out beyond the building to build people. It's an opportunity. You'll hear more about this in the Lent sermon series starting March 10th. Let me get back now to Jeremiah. Because life was changing in Israel, and Jeremiah was calling God's people to change. And he does, he's kind of creative the way he does this. You heard a reference to this in this passage. He puts a yoke on his shoulder. It, you read about it in chapter 27, the one before. Uh, he takes a wooden rod and, and some ropes, and he strings it over his shoulder. It's the kind of apparatus that you would put on an ox, two oxen to link them together and link them to a plow and move them forward through a field. Uh, it's, it's an image that you know, it, it, uh, implies progress and forward motion. It really symbolizes service. Because the question in their day is, whom do we serve? Who or what will give our lives direction? 
a little bit more history. In AD, uh, I mean in BC, uh, 593, there was a conference in Jerusalem in this year. It's an international conference. All of Israel's neighbors gathered together, Edom, Moab, Syria, Tyre. The ambassadors gathered uh, because they had been made in the prior few years all vassals of Babylon because of Nebuchadnezzar, this great warrior. And they were meeting to discover, uh, to discuss whether they could be uh, forming a regional rebellion. The, the spirit of the, the room was, we will not serve this king in Babylon. Jeremiah, though, it, it, because the Lord has spoken through him, it wants to counsel everybody not to go to war, not to take up violence, not to turn to political intrigue. I, I, instead, he's, his message is turn to God. Uh, serve God. Um, yoke yourself uh, to God. He walks around the conference with this yoke, around the palace temple, uh, around the palace and around the temple. God is the only one you can serve who will actually make you free, who will give you life. This is the message. And I think it points to Jesus. You remember Jesus. He says, my yoke is easy. And you remember Jesus. He says in John 8, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples. By the way, in the first century, the rabbis, they refer to God's word as a yoke. You're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and you'll be able to recognize what's true and what's not true, and the truth will make you free. This is the good news. Now, Jeremiah has been doing this for 30 years. He's been saying, essentially, unless we turn to God, we will be sent into exile for 70 years, not six years. You ask, well, how did he know that? Well, it's because thus saith the Lord. Yeah, but they both said, thus saith the Lord. How did he know that what God was saying to him was really the Lord? And the answer is, he had a blueprint for his life. Jeremiah did. Hear this. Jeremiah has built a life by listening to God. He's built a life by listening to God. He's in his 50s now. He's no longer a college freshman. Uh, but when he was younger, something really significant happened in his life. When he was, by my guess, 13 years old, they made a discovery. There was a massive construction project in Jerusalem. The king was named Josiah. He was a boy just about three years older than Jeremiah. And Josiah had ordered the renovation of the temple in Jerusalem. And while the workmen were under construction, digging around the temple, they found a scroll. It was, they call it the Book of the Law in 2 Kings 22. You can read the story there. Turns out, it's what we think today. It was the Book of, of Deuteronomy, an early form of the Book of Deuteronomy. It was God's covenant with Israel. Deuteronomy is where God says, I set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God. This is a blueprint for life. He's 13 years old. And, and, and it was very dramatic. He watched as Josiah and the leaders of Jerusalem took that scroll, read it, believed it, allowed it to challenge their convictions. And then they started to draw out implications of it for every aspect of their life, economic life, social life, political life. And there was this massive renewal that happened. And Jeremiah would never forget that. He was, as we say, in the room where it happened. And so now, three decades later, having experienced the power of, of, of God's word, of knowing that God always keeps his promises and relying on that as he builds his life year after year after year, he recognizes truth when he hears it. He knows what good news sounds like, even when it's hard news, because he's been doing what Jesus tells us to do, which is ab abide in my word. He says, if you continue in my word, you'll know the truth. If you continue in my word, if you remain in my word, the, the, the verb that he uses there is, is literally a house where if you abide, if you make my word your house, if you live in my word, if my word lives in you, then you're my disciple wearing that yoke and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It will give you life because that's what God wants even when he calls you through something that's hard. I want to give you a practice today, this week, as we've been doing. Um, two weeks ago, our practice was prophetic words of encouragement. Last Sunday, spiritual friendship. This week, live in the word. That's the way I would say it. Live in the word. 
just wanna ask you for one week, would you, would you experiment with me? Would you be willing to experiment for one week and say, I'm gonna take 10 minutes each day this week to read the scriptures? Whatever you're reading, you've got 10 minutes. You can do it, right? Um, if you don't know where to begin, I would recommend Romans 5 and 6. Let's read that. Those two chapters. You can read those two chapters in 10 minutes. You could do it every day. Or you could read a paragraph and spend a little bit more time with each paragraph, move through those two chapters, Romans 5 and 6. If you really want to live in the Word and really let it stick and remain with you, I recommend that you memorize a verse. That you pick one that speaks to you particularly, put it on a card, put the card in your pocket, carry it around all day, or make an appointment with you on the phone. I have one, Jesus... An alert, uh, he, I have an appointment with Jesus two, two a day, actually. My phone buzzes, and it's just Jesus. And then you put your memory verse in the memo field. I got, I, got, I got to go for a second. Jesus wants to talk to me, right? It's very impressive as a pastor. You could do that. And then you look at the verse, and you can practice it, right, every day, okay? Remain in the Word. Live in the Word. Let the Word live in you. Make it your home. Let it make a home in you. Again, Leslie Newbigin says, the business is not so much to understand the text as to understand the world, through the text. Well, there was no blueprint for the Winchester Mystery House. But it was what it was because Sarah Winchester didn't have a blueprint for her life. It was weird because Sarah Winchester had no blueprint for her life. There were words in her life not the word of God. There were all kinds of other words. They were the words of spirits. They were voices. Something saying to her, you have blood on your hands. You are guilty. And she didn't know what to do with that. She went to a medium, which is like one of any number of false prophets in the world today, who told her that as long as you entertain and confuse these spirits, you'll live. She lived in those words. And those words lived in her. And because of that, she built in fear all her life. Brothers and sisters, there are prophets of every kind in our world today. There's fake news and there's good news. The only words that matter are the words that you let in through the front door of your life and let live and abide with you. And let's be really clear, these words don't always give life. I'm reminded of Richard Russell, who lived with the words, I'm a broken man. My life is unredeemable, and he drove an airplane last year into an island in Puget Sound. I think of a, word, a woman I, I read about in the Seattle Times last week who is, who is fighting her natural weight, and she's living with the word that her husband spoke to her when he said, you know, I'm not attracted to you anymore. She's come to believe that she could not be loved unless she is beautiful in a particular way to a particular man, and that is slavery, but it will shape her life. Friends, God knows all about our lives. He knows about those stairways that we've got that go nowhere, those weaving halls that just seem like chaos. He knows about the doors that open to a blank wall or to a scary fall. But he's eager to redeem it. In fact, he has redeemed it all. He's reconciled us to himself and to one another, and that is the good news of the gospel. So as we go out from this place to build people, to build community around Seattle, that's our blueprint, the gospel. The good news of Jesus. Just, just think for a minute what, what Sarah Winchester could have built if she had had that blueprint in her life. She was one of the richest women in America. She would have built not just houses, but lives. Lives of people who are suffering the legacy of the Civil War. Lives of people who are struggling under Jim Crow lives. Lives of people who didn't know the power of the gospel to change their own lives and to change the world. I think this is why the Apostle Paul, when he says goodbye to the community he's built in Ephesus, says these words. Last words of Paul, some of the last words of Paul we have, actually, in the Bible. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up. Let's pray. God, we thank you for that message, the good news of Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, the embodiment of the living word of God who is in himself good news. We pray that you would make us builders, that we would join his great construction and renovation project at the heart of this world. Equip us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.